I wasn't in the survey actually. I was that was my first season digging, but I came up to the uh, I came up to the to the tell for a um, for a, a visit. That was one of the the weekly visits to the tell. So I remember standing on the top of the on the top of the site when uh, you were lecturing about it. We were up in it must have been on B two, basically where the, the B two dump is. Um, and I remember saying, well, this is a great site. And that was my first season excavating with a meet in, in A2. So I, I've been there, but I think y'all have just done the survey. Okay, so uh, the stage is all yours. The stage is all mine. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. And I've started Facebook Live, so we will see what happens uh, with doing these together. And I'm going to... Make the screen do that. See, okay. Hold on just a second. Let's swap displays. Okay. Hopefully, every everybody can see me. And I'm going to move myself out of the way. Okay. That's good. Everybody see it? It's the full screen, full picture. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Great. Um, so uh, this lecture is uh, in some ways a uh, discussion of some things that we've already talked about in the past. It's, it's, some of the things have been have been written about already um, with regards to the identification of uh, Tel Borna. Um, and some things are relatively new uh, related to um, the site of Etter. Um, I think something that hasn't really been um, discussed too much is the uh, is the reality of how um, Libna and Etter relate to one another. And, and that's actually kind of one of the, the focuses of this, of this talk is that there are a number of, of sites in the vicinity of Tel Borna, which again, we identify with, with Libna, that are of interest. Um, and even insignificant sites like Etter, uh, because there's no biblical stories uh, associated with it, actually give us a, a, a lot of information about um, a lot of information about the uh, cultural reality uh, behind the behind the various administrative lists, and of course, um, what the kingdom of Judah might have looked like internally. And so, actually, Tel Borna is, is is not the most important site in the region. We never have claimed that it is. Lachish or or Gath on the Philistine side is, and, but Libna is certainly more important, or Tel Borna is certainly more important than some of these other sites. But it is not certainly identified with Libna. I, I'm going to make the case that it, that it is, but we can't ever make a, a slam dunk argument, although I think all the evidence points to it. But in the case of Etter, the site is identified with almost absolute certainty because the name is preserved until this day with the same, uh, with the same term in Arabic that we, that we find in Hebrew. And so that's what I'm really excited about uh, is not only to explore more of, of what Tel Borna has in terms of archaeology, but to, then to look at Kirbit Etter or Kirbit Atar uh, and understand its, um, its archaeological uh, profile, because then that might tell us and help us better understand what were all of these towns in Judah actually like. Um, uh, so we have a variety of different things connected with them. So with that, let me go ahead and move on to my next slide. Now, most of what we're going to be uh, dealing with is historical geography. We're going to be talking about the identifications of, again, Libna and Etter. I'll provide in our, in our first part uh, kind of a summary of, of research um, associated with the identification of Libna. I won't spend too much time on that, but I think it's important to understand um, where scholars have looked since the uh, since the 19th and early 20th century, and how there is a, not, I wouldn't say complete consensus, but moving towards a consensus on the identification of uh, Tel Borna as, as, as Libna, and, and specifically looking at uh, a name that um, I, I think has been completely overlooked, and that is uh, an alternate name for our site of, of Tel Bulnab. And we'll look at uh, what, why is that important and how these names can shift over time. And then we'll look at how the remains at the site that we've excavated thus far compared to the biblical sources as well as the writings of Eusebius. And then finally, we'll, we'll turn our attention, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping to split it 50-50 on Etter and Libna, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. 
uh, we'll, we'll take a look at um, at Etter and, and, and delve into who has suggested that the site is retained and, and how the how the name starts to appear and how it appears in the biblical sources. And there's some really interesting features to that that I think are are worth considering. And then we'll close with our very tentative future plans. I mean, there there are future plans, but we don't know what the future holds. <laughs> We're all in kind of a uh, a state of, uh, of of trying to figure out and plan, um, but we, we do have future plans to to survey Etter even as 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 early as this fall. So we'll have to to wait and see if that will be doable. But I'll give you kind of a a bird's eye view of of, of what we're thinking. Okay. Now with with that said, again I, I mentioned that I'll go through um, a history of research of of, of Libna. So Libna is a site that is mentioned a number of times in the, in the biblical record, most prominently in the book of Joshua, where it's uh, mentioned on several di in, in several different um, uh, accounts, including uh, in Joshua 10 a few times, in Joshua 12, in Joshua 15, which actually are very different, um, I, I would call them different sources or different parts, uh, reflective of different periods. Um, and from these sources and, and later ones in, in the book of Kings and, and Isaiah, it is clear that that Tel Borna is in the region of the Shvela and that it is should be in, in close proximity to several towns, including Marasha, which is uh, not very far from uh, Tel Borna, a site called Tel Sandahana. And it should also be relatively close to Lakish because it's mentioned in uh, a conquest narrative associated with, uh, with Joshua in Joshua chapter 10. And so because of that, um, and until Lachish had actually been found, there was a, a wide variety of different opinions on the subject about where exactly it could be uh, located. So the first suggestions uh, identified it with a site not too far from Tel Borna, but to the west in the, in the, in the city of, of Kiryat Gat, Tel Arani. This is what Cla uh, Claude Condor suggested. Um, it, later, this would be identified wrongly again. Uh, as uh, Gath of the Philistines, which meant that the name in Hebrew became Kiryat Gat, which is the city of Gath, and uh, Albright's suggestion would live on as, as an error. Albright, uh, after this, would suggest that Telesafi actually was the site of Libna, connecting the name uh, and the white sides of the, the Tel, of Telesafi, which means the, the mound of shining, um, with the site of Libna, because in, in Hebrew, uh, Libna means white or has this idea of white connected with it. Uh, very quickly, that was abandoned, though, um, as Albright himself changed his mind when new uh, suggestions became available. Now, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to follow this, this one where we have Eliger and that uh, group of scholars, uh, mostly Israeli scholars there in the middle. But just to, to give some other honorable mentions to, to um, different suggestions, uh, the eminent uh, historical geographer Zechariah Kalai suggested that it was Tel Goded, uh, which is, I, I think, still, if, if, if um, Libna is not Tel Borna, which I think it is, but if, if, if it's not, I think Tel Goded remains uh, the most likely alternative because of its proximity. Much, much of the things match with uh, Tel Goded. Uh, I'll make a suggestion for what I think that site is later. It's commonly identified with uh, Moreshet Gath of, of Micah. I think that's also probably incorrect. Uh, but in any case, that's, um, I, I think, the, the likeliest alternative if Tel Borna is not um, Libna. Uh, others have suggested Tel Etun, uh, such as Gershon Galil. I think that site is uh, too far to the south to be connected. And I actually think that that's probably... Uh, biblical Etam, which is mentioned um, in one or two passages. Um, Yehuda Dagan, you can see his picture, so I'll move my screen down a little bit. Yehuda Dagan um, excavated, the, or he, I say he suggested in his survey that the site of Horvat Livnin was biblical Libna. Now, this is, a, I think, a good case study for thinking about and talking about how names shift in Arabic and how especially once the uh, state of Israel was established and we have a naming commission going out to name many of these Arabically named sites and, and naming them in modern Hebrew, they followed the opinion of, uh, of many different historical geographers. I already mentioned one with Kiryat Gat. And this site, for whatever reason, despite the fact that it's called um, Kirbet Tel Beda, 
uh, which means something like the 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 ruin of the tell of 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 white uh, was renamed uh, Lavnin, which again it, it, it's the same kind of uh, related to the same word in in Hebrew for for Libna, and so actually when you read Lavnin, it sounds like Libna, um, but that's actually not its name. It's that's a it's a modern uh, that's a modern name, um, and there's really no support for the toponymic connection between uh, Tel Beda. And, which is also uh, Horvat Lavnin and the site of Libna. And I would continue to suggest that this is um, biblical Oxy, which is mentioned again in the same district as, um, as, as Libna. And then finally, uh, Ron Tappy here suggests that his site of Tel Zeit is Libna, which uh, is, is very close, it's only about a mile to, to the west of us. We see it uh, when it's not too uh, hazy. We look over the bulls and we, and we see uh, we see uh, Tel Zeit off in the distance, but it's it, it's a very small site uh, for for one. And as it said uh, in our first lecture, it doesn't have seventh century, which is a which is a problem for for that. Um, and so since Eliger back in the in the 1930s, uh, many in his initial suggestion here, many have followed the opinion that um, Tel Borna or in, in Arabic Tel Bornat. The, the 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 tell of the hat, um, which is actually a kind of um, a kind of nineteenth um, century hat, so it's actually kind of a, a late name, but they suggested that the site is uh, should be associated with Libna, and that's what what our um, our team has suggested and continued to follow this suggestion, and, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just so you can see these different places on the map. We have here uh, Tel Birnat, which is just a, an, an alternate way of a, a, a saying Tel Bornat, uh, or as, in, as it is spelled in Hebrew, Tel Borna. And so I, as you can see here, I've labeled it as uh, Libna. And then Tel Judeda, which is, um, again, in, in, in Hebrew, is known as Tel Goded. And then over here, Kirbit Tel Elbeda, which is Oxiv. So this is one of the uh, suggestions, also known as Horvat Lavnin. Uh, Etun is not even on this map. It's, it's too far south to be included. And so those are the, the different candidates here. And as long as we have the map up there, uh, I might as well point out the location of Eter, which is just to the south, some mile and a half or so uh, to the south of us. And you can see the name uh, right there, as well as the site being marked. Now, as long as I have this uh, up on the screen, uh, a, a site that we should uh, really note um, for, for this, this, this data, uh, this, this, this area um, uh, for historical geography is the site of Beit Jibreen, which uh, those of you who have been to the area definitely have, 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 have seen because you've passed through, you've driven through, maybe you stopped at the gas station, maybe you tried your hand at being a gladiator in the amphitheater at Beit, uh, Beit Jibreen or Beit Gubreen. Uh, but the important thing for historical geography is that this is the site of Eleutheropolis. Uh, the site of Eleutheropolis um, was a, an important site in the Shvela, and for historical geographical purposes, it's important because it's, it, it's ground zero for a number of different uh, mileage markers from the great church historian Eusebius of Caesarea. He is going to list a, a wide variety of uh, of places in this region giving mileage markers from uh, Eleutheropolis. Uh, and so, for instance, it has here that Marasha is two miles from Eleutheropolis. He mentions Lakish is seven miles. Uh, and so this is really one of our, our best sources um, from, the, from the fourth century, third and fourth century, that gives us a, a much closer look into the, to the world of, uh, of the ancient Near East, the world of the, even the kingdom of Judah, even though it's a thousand years and more, uh, or I should say 700 years or so uh, since its destruction, um, because he, he gives us these names that have been lost to us. Now, one of the things he does say is that Lobna is a village in Eleutheropolis called Lobna, called Lobna or Libna is a, a village in Eleutheropolis called Lobna. He mentions that it's in the neighborhood of Eleutheropolis. So if Eleutheropolis is here, it means that uh, Libna at least Lobna of Eusebius's day should be located in close proximity to that. Now, in this in this uh, section, I just wanted to to give us a a brief rundown 
of the um, uh, of the different places in the variety in the different places um, and names that it was referred to. For instance, we have we have uh, Telbornat here marked on this uh, marked on this map. You can see that this is the survey of Western Palestine from the uh, from the 1870s. Um, you can see it's again its location to Beit Jabrin. Again, Otter or Kirbet Etter is right beside it. Now, this name again is is a name that is the most common name of the site before we start getting it in. Uh, modern Hebrew, and it becomes known as Tel Borna. But that's actually not the earliest name of the site. Uh, I remember when um, the lab used to be in another part of Ariel, and I I'd gone down there one day, and I was looking at this, uh, and uh, Itzik was actually there also, and, and I remember, well, this <laughs> he mentions a site that is a name that is very different than Tel, Tel Borna. Um, and that name ended up being, uh, in my opinion, quite significant. And actually, there are multiple names uh, for this site. You have here, moving backward in time, uh, from the survey of Western Palestine, the name Tel Bulnad. You can see the area of Gate Green, Tel Bulnad, Tel Zeit, just over there. And so even in the years before um, Condor and Kitchener visited the site in the, in the 1870s, there was an alternate name. In the 1860s, the name is even is, is also different. You have Tel Bulnard, uh, which is kind of a, of an odd name, but that's what Charles Warren uh, lists the site as. But the most important um, different name that is offered for these sites actually comes from a uh, a man named Charles William Van de Velde, um, and he didn't actually visit the site. He traveled, if you can see my mouse here, from the area of Beit Jabrin, and he went north, and he talked to uh, his local guide, and he said, oh yeah, over there is the site that is known as Tel Bulnab, or Bornab. Now that name, Bulnab, if that was in fact its name, with the L, is significant. It's significant because it, it, it allows for the possibility of a corruption of the name Libna, because you have all of the consonants there in the name. Now, this is a phenomenon that we see in, in, in many different sites. Sometimes it's the name in inverse. For instance, a site called Debir, biblical site called Debir, would become Kirbit Rabud. Actually, the name is just reversed. Uh, and we have this uh, occurring in, in, many different, uh, in many different contexts where the name is um, is, is corrupted over over time in from the original time in which the site was inhabited and from when different people pass the site and, and slowly the name gets uh, gets corrupted. Uh, and, and the most important thing to 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 gather from this is that Bornat or what we call now Borna was not the Arabic name of the site until Condor and Kitchener and actually Victor Guerin in the 1860s and 1870s visited visited the site. So this source tells us in the 1850s, just a decade or so before uh, the name would be almost canonized um, for, for later sources, that the name is actually different, which is important because it might retain this ancient name. And so for me, this is, this is important because toponymics, that is Arabic retention of a ancient toponym, is one of the key pieces of evidence for identifying biblical places with ancient ruins. And this seems to strongly favor, although again, not a slam dunk, strongly favor the connection with uh, biblical Libna. Now with that, um, let's move on and we're going to talk about now the identification of the site in relationship to its, uh, in relationship to its, um, to its remains. And what I've done here, and I don't want to spend uh, an enormous amount of time on this, but I, I want us to to, um, to just see the, 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 the places that, that Libna is mentioned in the Bible and, and, and relate that to the, um, to the finds themselves. Now, unfortunately, our site is not mentioned outside of the Bible, except in the Onomasticon, which, I, which I've already mentioned. It's not mentioned uh, as Libna in uh, texts like the uh, Pharaoh Shishak Karnak relief. It's not mentioned, of course, in, in Tutmos, it's not mentioned in any of the Assyrian 
uh, literature that we have um, related to the, the, the eighth and seventh centuries. Uh, but it is mentioned a number of times in the biblical text. Uh, and I, I believe that there's a, a strong connection between what we can see in the biblical text and what we have on site. Um, now, the first time it's mentioned is in Joshua chapter 10, which is a rather lengthy uh, text that talks about the campaign of Joshua to save the Gibeonites. You can see this map over here. Uh, and eventually driving the five Amorite kings, which include Jerusalem and Hebron and several others, uh, and then driving them down into the area of Makedah, which is over down here in this area, which is east of the site. And it's there that they uh, wage war against various uh, Canaanite sites in the Shvela. And one of those sites is the site of, uh, of Libna. Now, I don't want to spend, again, really any time on this at all, because I would actually like to focus on this, uh, on the next list. And this is something that I've been uh, working on uh, lately. In Joshua chapter 12, we have a, a rather odd list that is unlike uh, other lists in the biblical text, in that it lists the, the slain kings that Moses killed first, and then Joshua killed um, in, in, in his conquest of the land. Now, I have on this map, um, and I know it's kind of difficult to see, but you can see where I pointed to um, the area of Libna, um, that it records all of these places that Joshua is purported to have conquered and killed their king. Uh, all told, there are some 31 uh, kings, although there's you know, different, uh, different opinions about how to, to count them. And one of the real uh, interesting things is that if you look at this, if you look at this map, and if you look at the sites that are mentioned, the vast majority of these sites do in fact have late Bronze Age remains. In fact, you could make the case that all of them do. Now on this list, of course, there are uh, problematic ones like Arad and Bethel and I, uh, I should say uh, uh, I and Arad and Jericho, which remain part of this um, discussion about um, the, the historicity of, of the, the so-called Israelite conquest and that type of thing. And I'm not really getting into that now, but I'm just simply pointing out that in this list, uh, you can point to like 90% of these sites as having uh, late Bronze Age remains. And, and of course, uh, Tel Borna does in fact have late Bronze Age remains. Uh, and to be fair, we, we, we could say the same thing for, it seems Tel Goded does and Tel Zeit does, and these others also have these late Bronze Age remains as, as possibilities, uh, but it does seem to match on that front. Now, by way of, uh, of contrast, and this is getting into more of the, the meat that we'll talk about uh, today, um, the so-called administrative division, which I wrote my uh, dissertation on, in Joshua 15 uh, and 18, the Benjaminite and, and Judahite uh, lists of the book of Joshua, um, these uh, list dozens uh, of, of, of towns scattered throughout the uh, kingdom of, of, of Judah, uh, they're actually broken into several different regions, including the Shvela, the uh, hill country, the Negev, and the Midbar, the wilderness, um, which includes the area of, of in, in Gedi. Uh, and only about 40 or maybe 50% of these sites were occupied in the Late Bronze Age um, or the Iron One, um, whereas almost all of these, uh, and I would say all, uh, are for sure inhabited in the Iron Two. And the, fit, the, the period of time that I would say fits uh, the best is the, is the 9th century uh, BCE, which is what I argue for in my dissertation, although uh, it remains a possibility that the 7th century um, is, uh, is, is, is where that, that text, Joshua 15, um, the town list, and Joshua 18 ultimately relate to. Uh, but at the site, regardless of if it's, if it's 10th, 9th, or 7th century, uh, we have um, considerable remains from each of these periods, uh, including the ninth and, and especially the seventh, which really delineate the site. Um, now, here, this is where we're going to talk about uh, some some uh, some interesting features related to this uh, related to this district. Now, if you look at this uh, this map here, you can see three districts: districts two, three, and four. Now, district one is the Negev. Uh, if you go earlier in the book of Joshua, chapter 15, you can read about that, and we'll see a map 
kind of showing that in just, just a minute. But the Libna district itself is the central one right here, where it has all nine of these, uh, nine of these cities. It starts uh, with Libna and it goes in kind of a, a circle before swinging back to the site of Marasha. And it's these towns that are listed right here at the bottom as being in this uh, so-called Libna district. Um, and actually many of these sites, about half can be identified with a pretty high degree of uh, high degree of certainty. And here you can see on there, Libna and Etter right beside one another. And we have them marked as uh, one and two right there. And so those again, date probably to uh, sometime in, in, the, in the, definitely sometime in the Iron II, uh, when exactly remains a bit of a debate. Uh, the site also appears um, in the list of the Levitical towns uh, as one of the 48 towns mentioned there. Uh, this list remains heavily debated in uh, both conservative uh, and liberal and everywhere in between. Um, the kind of traditional view now is that the Levitical cities date to the to the uh, to the tenth century sometime in the United monarchy um, now I've, I've seen articles now written that it was uh, that it all dates to the Hasmonean period uh, which I think is no way but in any case uh, there's all there's all kinds of debate on on this list uh, I don't have anything particular to say about this other than to say that um, this list derives from the town list that we see in Joshua 13 through 19. In other words, um, it, whatever the Levitical cities are, whenever they date to, they present the same uh, geographical landscape of what we read in Joshua 13, Joshua 13 through 19. That is all the tribal allotments. Now, a possible um, connection to this and something that I'm interested in pursuing further, um, and it, which might relate also to the, the Persian remains that we found mostly on the summit, are references to the Libnites uh, or the, 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 the person of Libni, the son of Gershom, of the tribe of Levi, which is mentioned at different parts in the Pentateuch and is mentioned also in the Chronicler's genealogy uh, and may also appear in the book of Nehemiah and uh, uh, as Lebana and also in, in Ezra. Um, so this could be a possibility for seeing the, the name of Libna renamed um, from whatever the, the Canaanite site was to being connected with the Libnites, or perhaps that was the name all along, and they're just identifying with it. Um, but this is something that has not been closely examined, um, but it might relate to this Levitical, uh, it, its affiliation with the Levitical cities, th those who were the Libnites, who were probably those who related to the city of Libna. Now, to the historical uh, texts and how they relate to uh, the archaeology, we have um, in the mid ninth century during the reign of Jehoram, whom the Deuteronomist, Deuteronomistic historian uh, considers a scumbag in every sense of the word, and the chronicler uh, uh, doesn't defend him either. He's considered to be one of the worst monarchs. Uh, and as kind of the highlight of their um, derision for uh, Jehoram, it is said um, that, that, uh, that Libna revolted at that time and he lost the territory of the Edomites. Now, from a historical perspective, or at least from a biblical perspective, we think about the, the writing of the Kings, Edom is seen as a, uh, a, a main feature of Judahite prosperity. And so if they have uh, Edom under their control, that indicates that they are powerful. So we saw that, we see that with David, we see it with Solomon, we see it with Jehoshaphat reinstituting it in 1 Kings 22. Uh, and then Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, loses all that. And then right after it, we have the Edomites uh, again under their, under their control. So it's a sign of their success and, and prominence. And so it's, it's one of those things that stands out and says, this is not a good king because they lost the control of the Edomites. And so the revolt of Libna has to be compared to that in some way. Uh, and I think that's probably evidence of um, its connection with being a Levitical city and an important city but a site that was along the border. Uh, and it seems that this is somehow related to the uh, relationship to the, the, the growth of, the, of, the, of the, the kingdom of Gath in the 11th, 10th, and 9th century, 
right in the, in the in the decades or so before its massive destruction at the hands of Hazael of Aram Damascus sometime around 830 to 815 uh, BC or so. And in fact, we do have good evidence of the ninth century now uh, outside of the walls. You can see on this uh, aerial, we have a ninth century uh, surface. Actually, my wife and I, Mindy, uh, excavated. I remember uh, this is the first time we excavated in 2010, right down here. Uh, and uh, Jane has gone back to this area after Debbie excavated it for a few years and is exposing uh, some of this destruction outside of the walls. Uh, now that destruction might relate, probably relates to, to Hazael, but it shows that the site was inhabited and significant in the ninth century. Now the next uh, reference to the site um, is, is an important one and one that really stands out because of the historic veracity of Sennacherib's campaign. Sennacherib was of course the Neo-Assyrian king um, who led a campaign against Judah in the year 701 BC in his, in his fifth year. Uh, he writes about it a lot. He depicts it upon the walls of his palace at Nineveh, the siege and capture of Lachish. Uh, and the Bible talks about this uh, in three different parallel passages in Chronicles and Kings and, and Isaiah. Um, and in, in the case of Kings and Isaiah, after this famous showdown where the Rabshakeh goes with two other officials and stands on the walls of Jerusalem and they have this glorious trash talk back and forth, uh, with these other three officials of Hezekiah, it says that he comes back and he no longer found the king of uh, Assyria fighting at Lachish, but he'd moved towards Libna. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have uh, the results of what happened there because this is actually the setting uh, that the uh, king of, of Assyria, Sennacherib, seems to have led off his uh, attack on Jerusalem. And one of the things that we're toying around with or playing around with uh, is this, um, uh, this, this reference in the biblical text to how the camp is visited by the angel, by the destroyer, uh, and leaving aside whether or not uh, that has historical basis or not. The question is, where is, this, um, where is this camp? Most people have connected it with Jerusalem, and, and that, that may well be the case. But if you just read the text um, as, it, as it stands, uh, you could make a, a compelling case that the last place that we find Sennacherib in the text relates to him being at Libna. And so perhaps he never actually, um, he never actually visited the city because uh, in the text we have it mentioned that the Rabshakeh leads an army against Jerusalem while Sennacherib remains at the camp in, um, in the area of, of Lachish and then Libna. Now as far as remains from this, we have it everywhere. This is the dominant, um, this is the dominant period at the site in the 8th century, but the, the problem is, is that we don't have, um, we don't have a, a, a massive destruction. We don't have layers of, of, of burning similar to what were found at Lachish and other sites. Uh, it, it is destroyed, but the question is, uh, is it a destruction? <laughs> is it a fiery destruction? And it doesn't seem to have been. And so perhaps it was simply just defeated and uh, abandoned before being uh, occupied right after that. Now, uh, in relation to this last phase, before we move into uh, Eter, the site of, um, of Tel Borna does in fact have significant 7th century remains, uh, mostly, marked by, um, mostly marked by silos, uh, mostly living in the same context more or less as what we have in the 8th century, although we do have some reworkings of walls in areas A1 and A2, B2, and now, and now G. In fact, it seems that the gate that was used in the 8th century, the gate that would have been uh, presumably attacked by Sennacherib, uh, remained in use in the 7th century and wasn't closed up until the, the Persian period. Uh, although again, we'll, we'll, we're still you know, kind of analyzing this. But this is, uh, remains, in my view, besides the uh, possible toponymic connection with, with Bulnab, uh, the best piece of evidence that separates Tel Borna as the site of Libna because we do have in the biblical sources a very well-dated uh, reference to the late 7th century, uh, Hamutal, the, the wife of Josiah and mother of two of the last kings of, of Judah. And we have such a strong 7th century uh, layer at the site. And so if we put that all together, uh, it, in, in my view, it, it stands, um, it, 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 
we, we, we basically demonstrated that Eliger was right, that, that Tel Borna, Tel Borna should be associated with Libna, but we now have um, some, some good archeological proof to, uh, to, to back that up, plus some other new things that were not noticed before in terms of um, the, the name Tel Bulnab. And, and perhaps more will be found in future seasons, although it's still, I think, unlikely that we'll find the welcome to, uh, welcome to Libna sign. Now with that, I'm gonna transition and spend some time now talking about this nearby site the site of Kirbit al Etter or Kirbit Etter. And you can see here the name preserved there. Now that funny little squiggly line right there, that is an indication of a different letter in Hebrew, the letter Ayin. Uh, and this is one of the problems that we have with many of these names when we read them in English, is that we don't know if it's Aleph or Ayin that is retained. But in, in toponymics, it's crucial that we have the difference uh, between these letters. And so in Hebrew, Etzer actually starts with an ayin, just as the name in Arabic does. So Kirbet al Atar is actually the same name uh, as, the, um, as the biblical site. It's preserved as a one-to-one, -one, from Arabic to Hebrew. And so, as I said before, the name itself actually has a higher uh, degree of certainty as being conclusively identified with uh, with biblical etter, and we owe this identification uh, to the same guy who preserved the name of uh, uh, of Tel Bulnab, uh, Charles Van de Velde. He heard of Tel Etter and Tel Bulnab and records them, although he actually didn't visit either of these sites. Now, the first uh, the first person to uh, put it on a map is Victor Guerin. Uh, who would also be the same uh, first visitor to our site, Tel Bornat. Uh, and here we have the earliest, to my knowledge, uh, map showing the area of, uh, uh, area northwest of Beit Jibreen with any kind of, um, any kind of resolution. And so you see Tel Zeit over here on, on, the, on the left. Uh, we have uh, Etzer right here. Uh, notice uh, Tel Bornat is, is not there. Uh, it wouldn't be another uh, 15 years later that he would actually add it to the map, even though he visited it. I don't know if it just didn't get included or, or not, but we do have Etzer just there from his visit in 1863. And here is his later map. This is Victor Guerin. You can see he has added it and called it Kirbet El Hater. Now that uh, is probably uh, not the right spelling, but this H also indicates a guttural letter, the guttural letter for um, probably was trying to indicate Chet, uh, but other uh, sources indicate that it is, in fact, an ion. And so you can see again here the relationship between uh, these two sites. Um, and that's Victor Guerin. And then finally here, uh, going all the way back to our discussion on, um, on the survey of Western Palestine, you can see the sites are very close to one another. Uh, I didn't mention it before, um, but actually I, I'm, I'm thinking now that one of the real possibilities uh, for the Eusebius site is this place right here, Arak Hala. Um, this is a Roman Byzantine site uh, that, that was uh, partially excavated by uh, Boaz Zisu, and they found um, evidence of uh, perhaps a Roman military encampment uh, near Beit Jibreen that uh, could very well be the uh, site that, that uh, Eusebius refers to as being in the neighborhood of Eleutheropolis. The other candidate is this over here, Kirbet Corbett, Bornata, but I think this fits a little bit better. But in any case, you can see Kirbet al uh, Atar in connection with Tel Bornat. They're, again, they're very close to one another. And just to close off how these names get copied and, and, uh, and then better resolution, this is from just before the, um, the 1948 war, uh, which I think this is actually a very cool uh, picture because it's likely that a map just like this was used both by the defenders and the attackers of Beit Jibreen. That would be the, the, uh, the, the emerging uh, IDF, Haganah, Palmach, um, that we find evidence of at Tel Bornat with their foxholes and sometimes their dog tags uh, and lots of uh, bullet casings. And we have more or less the same thing at uh, Kirbet El Atar. We have, and we'll, I'll show you this in a minute, we have lots of foxholes ringing the summit. And so we, we can actually recreate 
uh, two of these dominant positions that were overlooking uh, this, uh, this encampment, which would fall in, um, in the, the War of 1948. And then finally here, as far as, as far as maps go, you can see what the modern maps look like. Uh, Tel Etter, notice how the name has been, I don't know if you read, read Hebrew or not, the name has been changed now to Tel Etter. It's not a Tel, it's, it's, it's a Kirbet, it's a, a Horvat or a one or two period ruined site, whereas Tel Borna is a, um, a, a, a Tel in, 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 in the strictest sense of the word. Uh, and we have, again, Tel Godet and Beit Ubring here. Okay, now with that said, let's uh, look uh, briefly here at the different references to Etter in the biblical text. So we did this with, uh, we did this with Libna. Now we're going to do it with, um, with Tel Borna. One of the really, or with, with, with Etter. Uh, one of the really strange things about the references to Etter and its sister site, the, the site of Ashan, is that it occurs in two seemingly very different geographically related uh, passages. It occurs in a, a passage that we've already talked about with the Libna district, but it also appears in the allotment of Simeon. So if you're looking at this map here with me, you can see this area marked in tan is the Simeon allotment or the, the Negev allotment. Actually, the, the Negev is marked in brown with the, the yellow marking it also being in the allotment of, uh, of Simeon. And so all of the Simeonite towns, the, the, the Simeonite allotment would be absorbed by, uh, by Judah. All of these are, are in the Negev. Uh, Ziklag, uh, for instance, uh, Beersheba, Sheva, uh, um, and, and many others. These are located in the Beersheba Basin. Um, and so it's, it's odd to find Etter and Ashan elsewhere. And actually, I, I would say that this actually created uh, a number of issues. Um, perhaps there's some confusion between Etter uh, and the site of Yatir, which is down here in the, in the center of the screen, marked there in, in District 5. And actually the name uh, Yatir uh, is kind of an interesting one because it also, in Arabic, is called Etter. So maybe there was even some confusion there uh, about these, these two different sites. But one of the, the things that I would just like to focus on real briefly here is that if you look at the uh, Simeon list, it is broken down into um, it is broken down into two groupings of, of, of towns, and so we have these other towns that are listed uh, in the south, uh, all centered around the area of Beersheba and the, and, and the Beersheba Basin. So in the, in the opening verses, and I'll read it here, Joshua 19 to Beersheba to Sharuhen. I didn't list all of them, but there's 13 cities, and then it says that there are four cities, Ein, Ramon, Eter, and Ashan. And then the parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 4 has Etam, Ein, Ramon, Tochen, and Ashan. And so the question is why they divided um, this group of 13 cities from four or five cities uh, in the different Simeonite lists. And so my, my conclusion is is that the reason why they divide it is because they're in different geographical region, re, different geographical regions. The larger list of what we read in Simeon is mostly in the area of Beersheba Valley, but where we have these other four or five towns, we can connect them, and I have it listed here as the reconstruction, with Tel Etun or Biblical Etam, Ein Rimon, um, for whatever reason, it gets listed separately as Ein and Rimon, but we know that it was in fact one name which gets identified with Tel Halif, Eter, which gets identified with Kirbit Atar, Ashan, my suggestion is Tel Goded, and Tochen, my suggestion is Tel Beit Mirsim. These sites are all actually Simeonite towns located in the region of the Judean Shvela, not in the Negev. And that seems to be the reason why they are divided. Uh, but because there's various textual critical problems as well as uh, issues of identification, this has not been something that has been noticed, but it remains uh, unassailable that um, the sites of Etter and likely Ashan relate to the region of, uh, of, of Libna and the Libna district, which is again in the Shvela as opposed to being in the Negev. And so that's just one of the interesting features about this. And if we think about identity of Levitical towns and Simeonite towns and Judahite towns as as tribalists, 
And if we think about them, how they relate to the emerging uh, kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of Judah, uh, however you want to refer to it, uh, this is just a, a really interesting feature that uh, bears close uh, examination. Now, uh, the next one is not certain. Um, this is a reference to the site that comes in another of these lists. Um, this is a kind of a famous list where uh, David has defeated the Amalekites at Ziklag, and he's got them on the run, and he's reclaimed all their spoil. And then it says that he is sending the, the tribute or the spoil as a blessing to the elders of Judah, uh, of, the, of, the, of the enemies of Yahweh. And he lists all of these towns, Bethel, uh, not the one in, in Benjamin, uh, not the one in Ephraim, uh, probably a, a one in the Negev, Rama of the Negev, which is mentioned, uh, for instance, in the uh, Arad letters, Yatir, Eroer, Sifmo, Eshtemoa, uh, and these, these here are in, in, in the Septuagint version, Carmel, cities of the Yermelites, cities of the Kenizzites, or Kenites, Horma, Bor Ashan, um, some say perhaps it's Beersheba, I think it's actually Ashan, which may be Telgoded, and then we have Eter, Eter right there, and Hebron for all the places where David and his men had Rome. Now, I have it listed here uh, as being the reconstruction. I'm not entirely certain that, what, that's, that it occurs there. Now, again, I'm not, as I put up this big, um, this, um, this, this big chart here, I, I'm not suggesting that we should uh, know all the, the details here, but I do want us to focus on how there are some differences. This represents what the Hebrew, the Masoretic text reading is. But there's a, a lot of variance in the Septuagint or the Greek translation. And it's there, if you look down here, we have a thak. That's actually what it reads in Hebrew or a thak. Um, but most have suggested that this is actually a, uh, an early corruption for Eter. And the reason why that would be the case is because the, the final letter here in Arabic looks very, or in Hebrew, excuse me, looks very similar to the Hebrew consonant resh. And so perhaps just a scribe simply mis uh, mistook that letter and that got introduced into the text, whereas originally it was etzer. And if so, we then have borashan and etzer, uh, the third example of how these two sites are connected to one another in the region of Judah. And so if we, if we look at that then, this will be part of the um, this will be part of the thinking behind when we go to a site called uh, Kirbet Eter, and we're trying to understand okay, is there a basis for this reconstruction that we read in the biblical text that many scholars have suggested? If so, when does it date to? Uh, does it date to the tenth or the eleventh century, the time period which the text purports to, to date? Does it date to the eighth century? Um, and if we can demonstrate uh, that the site was uh, occupied in the 10th century um, or the 9th century, uh, then we can make then we can make some some correlations. So that's the backdrop. That's the only um, sure references and unsure reference we have to the site of Eter. Uh, and I have up here on the screen now uh, a look at from this last season. Uh, this is our last day at the Tell uh, when we're taking the taking the images of, uh, of showing the different areas of, of Tel Borna. And it also shows you the relationship of the site to Eter, which is just over here. Uh, due south of the site, you can see Marasha, Eleutheropolis. This is my suggestion for Roman Byzantine Lobna and my suggestion for Ashan. So if you start that Libna district, Libna, Eter, Ashan, you can see how uh, that makes some logical sense. Now, one of the things that we were excited about last season, and I've always been bugging, uh, at least for the last five or six years, Itzik about going over to Eter and, and, and doing some work there uh, is that the site was burned. Uh, there was uh, some kind of local fire, and you can actually see that on the, on the image here, uh, which meant that we could, we could actually see more of the archaeological remains because of the, the burned landscape, uh, uh, which is something that, you know, if you have lots of rain, if you have lots of vegetation, it's very difficult to see. And so one morning, uh, bright and early, actually a couple mornings, uh, Terry and myself uh, came over here and took some aerial images. Uh, I made Bruno do this the year before, I think, 
and he did it by himself. So I have some images from, from Bruno as well. Uh, but you can see the site uh, down here under this where it says Kirbit Etter. You can see just a little bit of the, the profile of the site. The site is actually pretty large, goes over this whole area, uh, but it does, the Iron Age remains seem to be concentrated in this area here. So you can just see the uh, eastern edge of Tel Borna on this side, and there's Tel Goded, a very common site at 5 in the morning or 5.30 in the morning to watch it come over. Now, here's a look at just comparing uh, these two sites, comparing Tel Borna and comparing Ether. And again, we haven't surveyed it yet. We've only visited the site, picked up a few shirts, and just got an initial impression. But we also have um, Yehuda Dagan's survey, which was completed, I believe, in the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s of the site. He estimates that it's 22 uh, dunams, um, and that, which I think basically fits based upon what we've seen. And he indicates that the site had sherds from the Iron 2B or the 8th century, the Iron 2C of the 7th century, and then the Persian period all the way down into the Byzantine and then beyond into the Ottoman, into the Ottoman period. And so our uh, preliminary uh, analysis of this uh, seems to indicate that, but we also have remains from the earlier parts of, of the Iron Age, for sure uh, the 9th century, uh, and perhaps also even early Iron 2A, although again, this is just a, a very preliminary visiting the site for um, 30 minutes or so and, and, and not doing anything systematic and just even leaving much of the sherds there on site. Uh, so th that's one of the real questions. When is this site occupied? And we're approaching this from a, um, a kind of a regional project perspective. We now know uh, at our site, Tel now, that it has all of these as sherds. The, the survey revealed that uh, from the Calcolithic all the way down to the Byzantine period although by far and away, the periods of, of clear occupation are the late bronze from, uh, and, then, and then again in the 10th century, all the way down through the Persian period. This is what we found uh, in all the different areas. You can see A1 and A2, B1 and B2 all the way down. Uh, whereas B1 is this big late bronze age layer that we don't find, uh, we haven't found in other parts of the site. By contrast, we don't have any bronze age sherds either in Dagon's survey or in our initial, uh, our initial survey. It seems like a site that was established at some point in the Iron Age uh, and then remained a site all the way through beyond that. And so this is a really significant um, for, for me because this might allow us, uh, again, to understand what one of these smaller towns might have looked like. Uh, here's a look at um, the site. This is a, a more close up view uh, you can see this wall running through, and this might also be a, a fortification. It's not a massive fortification, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's one that runs all the way around the site. Uh, and if you look closely, besides seeing Ladislav and Michael and myself and Terry, uh, who are, who are, who are uh, taking a look at the site, uh, you can see that wall again running through. But all along it, you have this zigzagging back and forth. This is a clear sign of the foxholes uh, of the Israeli soldiers in 1948. And so again, we have a, a point of comparison uh, to, a different, uh, to a different period, but it could be that just like at our site, they're digging directly into the Iron Age fortifications. And so one of the big, uh, one of the main research questions is to see if this, if this is in fact a fortification and if it does uh, date to the Iron Age, it, which if so, uh, would be another uh, point on the map and another piece of the hierarchy of, um, uh, of the ancient kingdom of Judah. You can see that even more clearly here. This is the circle of the site uh, going around in a circle. It seems like there was some damage here, perhaps a bulldozer or something removed it, um, uh, cut through this area. Uh, at least that seems to be the case from the surface. This is another image from the, uh, from the west. You can see the site over here. Uh, this nice uh, this nice circle again not very elevated not very uh, prominent site but still the same time period seemingly the same fortifications actually more or less the same uh, square footage uh, and then probably sometime in the Roman or even Byzantine period the site expands this direction you can see this long I don't know if it's a terrace wall or what it is yet exactly but all kinds of architecture emerging here we found evidence of a cistern and other things in our brief visit of the site. And another look there, even showing more architecture 
further you go out. Uh, here's another look. You can see the, a nice profile, how it is, in fact, uh, have, uh, you can see that it, uh, that it, it emerges from the area of the bedrock. And we have some type of built up fortification there. Uh, by way of scale, you can see us still sitting on the mound. Okay, so what have we looked at? We've looked at how Telborna is likely uh, biblical Libna. Eliger's suggestion uh, still seems to be uh, the most likely. We looked at the archaeological support in relationship to the biblical text. We then look, turned our attention to Eter, uh, which is not a, a controversial view. Um, to my knowledge, almost everyone accepts this suggestion that Kirbit Eter should be related to biblical Eter. Uh, we talked about the really interesting relationship between the Libna district and the Simeonite allotment and the Negev allotment, uh, and how this seems to be that they're not one and the same, but how they're all kind of integrated with these different ideas of identity associated with uh, perhaps the tribes of, of, of Simeon, but also if we connect this with the Levitical towns um, with, with the Libnites uh, and how all of this identity seems to be emerging as, um, as the kingdom of, within the kingdom of Judah. We also talked about the possibility of Eter appearing in the uh, Amalekite spoil list, although that remains to be um, seen and may actually never be proven with certainty. And then finally, we talked about our archaeological plans um, uh, to, to, for, for future activity at the site of 